How many people here don't know what they want to do when they grow up? That's what I thought. <laughs> the good news is you're not alone. I've been fortunate to have two careers so far. First one was I was a venture capitalist for over 20 years, investing in entrepreneurs who are starting technology companies. It combined my interest in investing, technology, and allowed me to work with incredibly interesting people. More recently, I've been trying to be a teacher, trying to be an instructor of entrepreneurship, and finding my way in that. And for, for a variety of completely different reasons, it's been very satisfying to me also. I've learned four things in that journey that are really important to, to finding. Most of these have come from talking to, to finding something that's really satisfying. Most of these have come from talking to other people. And I want to walk through them with you. Um, they, they make a, a relatively unfortunate acronym, but I'll let you figure that out. Number one, take initiative. Number two is amplify your inner voice. Three is risk failure, and four is persevere. It's hard. <laughs> Let me say that again. Take initiative, amplify your inner voice, risk failure, and persevere. I want to tell you a couple of stories. I grew up in New Jersey. I went to high school. I was a good student. I was not a great student. I was also a wrestler. I was not a good wrestler. <laughs> I was an average wrestler. This is, I'm not in this picture, but if I was in this picture, I'd be the guy with the black eye on the bottom, <laughs> with mus much less muscle definition. <laughs> when I got to be a senior in high school, like all of you, I went around and visited colleges. I wanted to go to college in the Northeast. And I fell in love with Dartmouth College. Went to my college counselor, told him I wanted to go to Dartmouth College. He told me I was crazy. He said, you're not a good enough student. You shouldn't apply to Dartmouth College early decision. I said, OK, you're a smart guy. This is what you do for a living. I had some family connections at Williams College. He said, you might have a shot there. Apply early decision to Williams. So I did, and I got rejected, thank God. So I'm thrown in the regular pool of admissions. I apply to a lot of colleges, and I throw an application into Dartmouth. And one morning, I come down to breakfast. My father's reading the paper. And he says, you want to go to Dartmouth College? And I said, I do. He said, OK, here's what you do. Dartmouth Wrestling, will, uh, Columbia, in New York City today. You should skip school. Take the train to New York, jump on the subway, go up to Harlem, find the gym, get there early an hour before, watch the match. I guarantee you, no one will be at this match. Maybe one set of parents from New York City. <laughs> but it will be an empty gym. After the, after the match, go up to the coach, introduce yourself, and tell him you want to wrestle at, at Dartmouth. Now, I was totally shocked by this. First of all, my father was relatively strict. And to, for him to be telling me to skip school was a bit of a shock. But secondly, I was having waves of anxiety about me, the guy in the bottom with the black eye, uh, trying to convince the Dartmouth coach that I was recruitable material. But my father was a smart guy, and so I, I took his advice. I went. And he was exactly right. The gym was empty. I went up to the coach. I introduced myself, took a deep breath, and said, I, I really want to wrestle at Dartmouth. And he was surprised. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, OK, well, and we talked for a while. And he said, OK, um, uh, why don't you come up to Dartmouth for a recruiting visit? You can meet the team. And you know, we'll get to know you. And, we, and I did that, and it was a great weekend. And at the end of it, he said, I really enjoyed getting to meet you. I'll put in a good word for you at the admissions office. Four months later, big envelope comes. I got accepted to Dartmouth College. I wrestled the first year. 
Dartmouth disbanded the wrestling team. Not enough people were going out for wrestling. <laughs> but when I, I talked to him later, and he said, you know what I told the admissions office when I called them? I told them that you weren't good enough to wrestle at Dartmouth, but that you had initiative. You did something very unusual to the high school students. You came up to me and you tried to sell yourself. And that made a big difference. Anybody know who this is? Exactly. Ralph Waldo Emerson. He wrote a great essay on self-reliance. Um, and if you ask the average person, what does self-reliance mean? They tend to say, I'm an island. I don't need anyone. I control my own destiny. I make my own cheese. <laughs> but if you look up self-reliance, there's, really, there's a second definition. And that's having the confidence to listen to your own voice. That's ha having a confidence that what you think is true. And that's what I think Emerson was trying to say to us. He has a quote in, the, in this essay, and I really, this is a hard essay to read. The guy's not pithy, but I really recommend everyone read it. He talks about the inner voice. These are the voices that we hear in solitude, but they grow faint and, and inaudible whenever we enter the world. Society everywhere is a conspiracy against the, the manhood of every one of its members. The virtue in most requests is conformity. The virtue in most re requests is conformity. Self-reliance is an aversion. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. This is a long quote, um, but I thought, it was, I thought it was very apropos. It's out of the same essay because it basically, basically is, would be true today just as it was true 170 years ago. One more story. <clears throat> so I graduated from college. I got a job in a big company. I liked it for a while, but it quickly became repetitive, repetitive and I became miserable. And I did what all good, well-educated liberal arts students do when they become miserable in their first job. I thought about graduate school. <laughs> I went to business school. And in business school, I discovered venture capital and worked really hard and was successful at getting a job at a venture capital firm in Minneapolis. And I got to back up here a little bit. My dad died young. My dad died when I was in college. And one of the things I always regretted, that he traveled a lot. He was a salesman. And I didn't get to spend as much time with him when I was a teenager as I had hoped. So one of my personal goals was to find a career where I did not have to travel as much. So I'm working in Minneapolis. Things are going well. I, after two years, I get promoted to be an investment manager. Um, after another two years, I got promoted to be a junior partner, and they gave me some equity in a small fund that could be very valuable. could have been worth probably enough to pay for one college education at Middlebury. Very significant amount of money. Um, the problem was that Minneapolis is a relatively small town for a venture capitalist, and all my partners were from there and had all connections with all the entrepreneurs in town. So it was very difficult for me to find new investments. And I was under a lot of pressure to prove that I could identify new startups, new opportunities, and invest in these companies. So I was spending a lot of time in Boston and San Francisco looking for deals, looking for, looking for entrepreneurs. And I came home one day, and I was playing in the backyard. By this point, I had one child. I think my son, Doug, who is here, was probably um, within, day, within weeks of being born. Um, but I was playing with my daughter, Kate, in the backyard, and she was about this age, and she, a plane flew over. And she pointed at the plane, and she said, Dada. And uh, it's actually a little emotional just telling that story. Um, it, sort of, it sort of, it was like, a, like a, a knife in the heart a little bit. This was something that I had committed to not happening, not to be the father who was always traveling. And here my child was associating me with an airplane. So I said, I've got to change this. And so I spent the next week coming up with a plan to convince my partners that we ought to open an office in Boston. And I went to them with this plan, and I presented it to them. And it was a low-risk plan. What I said to them was, 
let me go to Boston and open an office. I won't hire any people. I'll work out of my house if you want. And after a year, you evaluate me. And if you don't like what you're doing, fire me. I'll go find another job. So I presented it as very low risk. They said, no, that's a bad idea. We don't want to do that. Um, there's already enough venture capitalists in Boston. So I went back. Two days later, I'm sitting in my office working on something. Oh, I said at the end of that, OK, well, I'm going to leave. You guys have been great to me. I'm very grateful for everything you've taught me. I don't want to do anything behind your back. So I'm going to tell you now before I go look for a job, and I'm going to look for a job. Two days later, he came in my office. And he said, my boss said, OK, give it a shot. Give me some more details. So we moved. We moved to Boston. Um, I really didn't have a lot of confidence that this would work out. But um, or a, a lot of, I, I had confidence. I didn't have a lot of specific plans on how it was going to work out. Um, <coughs> but I, I figured it would work out, and I would, I would find a way to make it work out. So we moved, um, and I set up shop. And it was touch and go for a while. I had to ask for an extension on my one-year plan several times. And I resold the idea, and I proved to my partners that things were working. But um, in the end, it worked out fine. Fifteen years later, uh, we've made a lot of good investments and have been very successful. So I want to close with my favorite quotation. Many of you have probably seen this, but this is by far and away my favorite quotation. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more, more common than unsuccessful people with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full, is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. And I believe this is also true of the problem of, of all of us trying to find our mission in life, trying to find what, what we're really supposed to do. Persistence is key. So it comes back to four things. Take initiative, amplify that inner voice that is easily overwhelmed by the outside world, is easily overwhelmed by other people's expectations of you. Risk failure. We live in a world where I think, if you think about it, many of the inventions, many of the significant inventions that have happened in the last hundred years have all been about reducing risk in our lives. Simple things, smoke alarms, carbon monoxide detectors, airbags. Um, you can go on and on with the list. We're not that used to, to taking risk. Risking failure is something we need to think about. I'm not a big believer, by the way, in risking huge, uh, taking huge risks. But calculated, um, intentional risks uh, are worth it. And then be persistent. This is a hard problem. These are the four things that work for me. I hope they work for you. Good luck.